The G4560 might be something of an i3 killer, but we still wanted to know just how far the CPU can be pushed before it starts choking GPU performance. We're looking for the point of diminishing returns in today's test. It's unlikely that someone who buys a $70 CPU would also buy a $500 GPU, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't try to better understand how the CPU scales with cards priced from $115 to $600. Before that, this video is brought to you by Corsair's new Vengeance RGB LED RAM, which ships with custom screened ICs for better overclocking performance and stability. Given that memory is highly relevant for performance with new Ryzen CPUs, now is a good time to do research on high performance kits. Start with the Vengeance RGB LED kit at the link in the description below. The G4560 is a CPU that we reviewed highly and said that it competes with Intel's own i3 lineup for a much cheaper price. It tends to be about $70 on retailers. And it's clear that an ultra budget targeted CPU like this one, which is clearly capable of gaming based on our review, would be most likely paired with something like a GTX 1050 or an RX 560, or maybe something below those. But those are pretty obvious choices given the price and given that everyone knows about where their performance falls. What we didn't know is how high end of a GPU can you get to before you are really wasting money, not just a little bit starting to hit diminishing returns and waste money, but lighting it on fire and completely wasting it. So we're testing today from a 1050 Ti and up. That includes 1050 Ti, 1060 SSC, 1070, and 1080 from NVIDIA, and we've also thrown an RX 570 from AMD and an RX 580 Gaming X. The 570 will be interesting to pay attention to because it's a step beyond the 1050 Ti, and we've generally recommended the 470s, now the 570s, over something like a 1050 Ti if the extra money is affordable for you. But with the new price reduction, 1050 Ti's being around 115 with rebates pretty commonly, and with the 570 coming out and changing things up a bit, it's worth looking at how both of them perform in relation to one another and in relation to the CPU specifically. We did not include the 1080 Ti, because once you start hitting the 1080, you're really starting to hit the cap. Uh, and also the 560, 550, and 1050 are all well within the CPU's performance abilities. That means that if you run one of those GPUs with the CPU, in every game we've looked at, uh, the CPU has more in it that it can push if you were to get a better GPU. So those are not going to be bottlenecks, which means they are not included. For testing methodology, as always, check the links in the description below where we've got the full review, testing methods, and all the charts in plain text format if you want to check that out with a couple of extra notes. Uh, but for now, let's dive straight into the benchmark, starting with GTA 5. Starting with GTA 5, we immediately see our point of bottlenecking at the GTX 1080 and GTX 1070, where the two perform effectively identically. They're well within test-to-test -test variants here, and the 1080 FTW and 1070 SC are both locked to around 100 to 101 FPS average. These cards are, again, equal in performance. The GTX 1060 SSC runs 96 FPS average, so we have some performance degradation, making the 1070 and 1080 about 4.9% faster. That's definitely diminishing returns for buying anything more than a 1060, since the price hike is so big and the performance gain is so small. But to further illustrate this, we can see that the GTX 1050 Ti scales almost completely to the 1060, where the 1060 runs 52% faster than the 1050 Ti. An RX 580 is also nearing the cutoff point of 100 FPS, but it doesn't push quite as hard where it gets there. What we learn from this is that anything from a 1060 and down, and that would include the 570, the 1050 Ti, or even its equivalent RX 580, none of those would be sufficiently bottlenecked by the G4560 in this game. The cutoff point is 100 FPS for these settings with this CPU, at which point we experience diminishing returns. But that's just one game. That's not enough to make a conclusion. Let's look at Total War Warhammer next. Total War Warhammer has a similar cutoff point where we'll start seeing some scaling with the higher end cards, but it's to the tune of 1 to 2 FPS average once at the GTX 1060 levels and beyond. Scaling from the 1060 to the 1080 is an improvement of just 4% total, which is nothing close to what we see in our normal GPU benchmarks when the CPU limitation is removed. The GTX 1060 is also significantly cheaper, so clearly there's no reason you would ever spend that much money to gain 4% FPS. But looking at the 1070, 1080, and 1060, we see that they are all functionally equal in this game when paired with the G4560. The RX 580 is not too distant from this group with its 97 FPS average, and as previously, you could purchase anything from a GTX 1060 or RX 580 and downward, and end up just fine. You're more or less at the limit of what the CPU could do. 
the 1060 seems to be about the cutoff point for this game. Sniper Elite is the odd man out, where the game's DirectX 12 native integration and asynchronous compute functions permit the CPU draw call workload to largely shift to the GPU. In this instance, we see some really interesting results. The scale in it goes all the way up to the GTX 1080, surprisingly, where we've got a 170 FPS average at 1080p with high settings, and that puts the 1080 about 27% ahead of the GTX 1070, which really isn't all that bad. 1070 is at 134 FPS average, and is therefore about 38.5% of the GTX 1060 SSC. The RX 580 Gaming X runs a 109 FPS average, but none of these cards are at the limit of what the CPU can handle, because as we can see with the 1080, we're really doing just fine with all of them. We'd strongly recommend not basing purchases on this one game though, as this is an extremely rare case in the gaming world now, especially when we look at things like its SLI or Crossfire scaling, which are nearly 100%. Not many people would consider coupling a 4560 with a 1080 to begin with, but it's worth noting that you shouldn't just because of this one game. Let's look at another DirectX 12 title to see what happens there. Now we're looking at Ash's Escalation, the GPU benchmark specifically, which may as well be a synthetic test at this point. Escalation has the GTX 1080, 1070, 1060, RX 580, and RX 570 all performing mostly the same, with no difference visible until the GTX 1050 Ti, which isn't that much behind, but it's really the only one that starts to show a difference. The cutoff point seems to be about the RX 570 here, and if we look at the ashes of the Singularity CPU benchmark, just to kind of prove a point, we can see that the CPU performance is the same in all of these tests, regardless of which GPU is used, because it is properly a CPU benchmark, more akin to what a synthetic benchmark would do than what most games would do. Battlefield 1 is next with DirectX 11 and 1080p Ultra settings. Battlefield 1 posts some scaling for the 1080 from the 1070, though it's limited to 11%. We normally see more than this when not CPU limited, i.e. when testing with a 7700K. And although the 1080 posts improvement, it is well into the point of diminishing returns. The GTX 1070 holds an improvement of 18% over the GTX 1060 SSC, or 12.5% over the RX 580. Scaling seems to choke past a GTX 1070 list game, although you'd get better value with a 580 or a 1060 based on performance in the other games. Ghost Recon Wildlands is another title where brute force gets us some extra frame rate, but we start encountering limited gains once again at the top end. The GTX 1080 runs about 9.7% faster than the 1070 list game, which in turn runs 15% faster than the 1060 SSC. We experienced a weird reproducible issue with Ghost Recon Wildlands where the RX 580 is producing results that vary pretty heavily after the first pass even. This isn't something we saw when testing with the i7-7700K and this GPU, and only encountered with the 4560. Here's a look at some of the numbers in order of test execution top to bottom. We did two complete runs, each with four test passes or more, and each after a system reboot. The first pass spikes, second pass drags, and then things begin to level out after that though with higher end CPUs, we were seeing very steady, reliable performance. We're not sure what's causing this on the 4560, or if it's some kind of driver difference or Windows difference between the two test systems, but we also observed interesting performance in Watch Dogs 2 with the same card, and we're awaiting further thoughts from our industry contacts, including those at AMD and Nvidia, to hopefully better understand what's going on with both Watch Dogs 2 and Ghost Recon Wildlands. Either way, it's looking like the cutoff point is about the same as in some of the other games we've tested as far as when the GPU becomes bottlenecked by the CPU. So depending on which game you're looking at, there's no scaling in some of them, and there's massive scaling in Sniper Elite 4, which it makes sense. Sniper Elite 4 is one of the only really well-built DX12 or low-level API titles at all, with its neighbor being maybe Doom, and it uses uh, async compute. It's generally not that intensive of a game to begin with, and so it's performing well. But that is what you would call an outlier. That's not to minimize its performance, but you should not base a GPU purchase with a $70 CPU on that one game, unless perhaps it is the only game you will ever play. As far as other games, GTA V, Total War Warhammer, and Ashes of the Singularity show basically no scaling whatsoever between a 1080 and a 1070. And the cutoff point really, if you wanna get the best value, seems to be about a 1060 at the very high end. Though to be fair, if you're spending $70 on a CPU, you'll probably be just fine with something that's a more realistic purchase for you, which might be something in the range of a 1050 Ti. Uh, of course, there are plenty of neighboring options as well, depending on if you've got more or less money. The 570 is fine, the 1050 or the 560 are fine as well. 1050 Ti sits plainly in the middle. But either way, 
once you had a GTX 1060, it's hard to justify going beyond that, uh, even if you wanted to upgrade the CPU later. Now, that said, the GPUs and the CPUs do well enough together in these titles, all of them, that if you wanted to buy a 4560 now for some reason and upgrade to something like a 7700K later, you could do it and still get a lot of your performance out of those cards. Just expect that it'll start choking at some point once you're 1060 and beyond. But overall, hopefully this will help someone out there with a PC build determine how high end they should go with the GPUs. Scaling is fairly clean from even the 1050 Ti to the 570 to the 580 and 1060. Uh, just it gets muddy after that depending on games. So that's all for this one. As always, you can go to patreon.com slash gamersnexus to help us out directly with this type of benchmark feature testing and gamersnexus.net for the full article. Links in the description below for more information, store.gamersnexus.net for shirts like this one. I'll see you all next time.